What evidence do we have for Adam and Eve, Noah's flood, and the Tower of Babel event in the human genome? The historical claims about human history in the Bible are quite clear, yet most evolutionists reject these claims based on a superficial study of available genetic data. Our guest today will reveal not only can the claims be tested, they can be confirmed. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Noah's Flood Genetics with Dr. Rob Carter. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman. It's my privilege to be your host. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts, validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. Robert Carter, did his undergraduate work at Georgia Tech and earned a PhD in marine biology at the University of Miami. Currently, he's a popular and much in demand speaker for Creation Ministries International the U.S. office being in Atlanta, Georgia. His research centers on human genetics, human history, and other issues related to biblical creation. Dr. Carter, I always love it when you're our guest. You do a great job for us. What are we going to talk about today? We're going to look at um, our origins with Adam and Eve. Yeah. And then the genetic effects of Noah's flood and the Tower of Babel. All right. Well, that's fascinating. Will you go to the board and okay. help us? All right. In any study scientific study using the Bible as a basis. We have to acknowledge that the Bible claims to be the history book of the universe. And so just starting with that as an assumption, let's see if this history actually fits what we've discovered in human genetics over the last you know, couple of decades. The Bible specifically claims that God created all things in six days and created people on the sixth day of creation, but it only started with two people, Adam and Eve. Genesis 2, 7, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Notice there's no evolutionary history of mankind here. We didn't Nothing. evolve from monkeys. We were created specifically by God. By God made Adam. But where does a woman come from? Well, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up his place with flesh. And the rib the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So we started with two people. One man and one woman. That is a profound statement about genetics right there. Okay. Because that influences the way people should look today if we only started with two people. But about 1600 years later, something happened. The whole world population was reduced to eight people at the time of Noah's flood. Now, if you just add up the ages given to us in the Bible, Noah was born about 1056 years after creation or anno Mundi, year of the world. Okay, the year the world was made. Yeah, it's a neat way to date things. The Bible says in Genesis 7, Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came upon the earth. So Noah's flood was about 1600 AM. I round it off. Yeah. So the question we have is, how many people could have been on the earth after 1600 years? That's going to influence the genetics of the people after the flood. Starting with two. Starting with two, how many yeah. could you possibly get? Well, since we don't know how far apart the children are or how many children on average per couple or uh, how old the women are when they start, stop having children, all these things we don't know. A friend and I, we actually published this in our Journal of Creation a couple of years ago. Uh, we wrote a massive computer program. It's a population modeling program. We threw all those parameters in there, including the rate of twins being born and whether or not there's polygamy in the society. <laughs> and all those things have a, a little effect. And each of these bars is the result of 100 computer runs. That's the average. Now, depending on how far apart the children are and, and how young the women start having children, we showed that some population can go extinct. Yeah. And some population can grow at up to 8%. Now, in 8% population growth, the population doubles every nine years. Oh. Okay. So that's a Just massive population. So now, how fast did it grow? I don't know but somewhere in, in that range. Even with slow growth, 
slow growing populations, we got thousands of people in just a couple of hundred years after creation. Now these three curves, this is how old the woman is when they start having children. So if they wait until they're 80 years old, so Adam and Eve's first daughter has to be 80 years old before she has her first child. Even with that delay, we've got about 8,000 people after about 400 years. Huh. So how many people at the flood? It could have been millions. I suspect from the genetics that it wasn't. I think it was much smaller than that, but the possibility for a massive population is there. My best guess would be um, hundreds to thousands of people okay. at the flood. And then Noah's family was picked from that group. All right. Genesis chapter 9 gives us another statement about genetics. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Well, the Bible says there that all people on earth came from three couples. Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their three sons. That's a profound statement. Is that possible just 4,500 years ago? Actually, yeah. But there's one more thing that happens with human genetics in the Bible. And that's the Tower of Babel event, where a couple of generations after the flood, the people are already acting wickedly. So the Lord dispersed them from there, that's Babel, over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. When did that happen? That's a great question. Well, in Genesis chapter 10, it says to Eber, descendant of Shem, to Eber were born two sons. The name one was Peleg. For in his day, the earth was divided and his brother's name was Joktan. Now, people debate over what this division means. Some people say that was continental drift. No. Some people say, oh, no, that was um, the land flooded. And therefore, it, you know, people got divided. I don't think so. The context here is the Tower of Babel. Okay. So the context of the Tower of Babel happened during the life of Peleg. And adding up the ages from Shem to Eber to Peleg, we, if you add up all these ages, you get between 101, and that's when Peleg was born about, nominally, and 340 years, that's when he died. That's when the Tower of Babel should have happened. A couple of centuries after the flood. Okay. Now, how many people could have been alive then? Well, that, remember that last slide, the slide a couple slides ago when I showed those curves going upwards? You could easily have had thousands of people at um, the Tower of Babel. Looking at the potential growth rate of human populations, we can ask, actually ask the question, how come there are only 7 billion people? Yeah. Oh. And my answer is, most people ever born died of starvation, disease, or warfare. Wow. Because the population could have grown much, much, much faster yeah. than it actually did. There's another interesting genetic thing, and that is the Exodus. So the Bible says that 70 people went to Egypt. But Exodus 12 says that about 600,000 fighting males left Egypt. And if you have 600,000 fighting age men, your population, you have to have about the same number of women plus old people plus young people. The population, some people estimate, somewhere around 2.7 million Hebrews left Egypt. Wow. That, can you go from 70 to 2.7 million in 480 years? Can you? What do you think? I, I think we did. I think we did, but that's a big difference, isn't it? Sure it sure is. Oh, okay, well, let's look at this, first of all. In that same computer model, we started with 70 people. And in this case, we're, we're, we're um, saying the children are one year apart, two year apart, three, four, or five years apart on average. Not that every woman always had a child every one year, but at the minimum, it was, was that was our setting for our model. And what we showed then over 480 years, every single model we ran had more than our required 2.7 million people. So it's easy to get that number of Hebrews in 480 years, starting from 70 people. Very good. Now, granted, this is, that's ridiculous. Right? These numbers, that's, that's not a number, but, but that's not possible. But this is possible. Uh -huh. 
The land can't hold that many people. It can't hold that many. And you can get that big in that much time. But some scholars believe that the sojourn was only 215 years long. Fine. Well, we ran that model also. And after 215 years, a number of our computer models had more than that 2.7 million uh, people that are required. And the answer is all you have to do is have children spaced very closely together. That's very interesting stuff. Um, and it's just really fun to apply computer models to genetics and biblical history just to see what we could do. Now, I stole this from a government website. And it's, it's their fault. It's not the best picture in the world. But they're saying here that this is the population size over time going all the way back to, you know, they believe way before, uh, before the Bible says the world was created. But essentially, there's about a million people alive across the world for tens of thousands of years. And all of a sudden, somebody invents farming. And that means that extra population can be handled because there's more food. And on all of a sudden, the population does that, and we have 7 billion people today. So food is, you could see how food is integral to, to living. So it's, it's basically survival mode for thousands of years. Yeah, but did this really exist? No. And how come the people with the same genes back here who were just as smart as people here, they didn't think of planting something in the ground and harvesting it the next year? So this you, is really magic back here. Right. Taking that thought, I applied that to a biblical idea where this is the flood, this is today. And starting from those six people, all you have to do is double the number of people every 156 years. And you arrive at 7 billion people after 4,500 years. That's a growth rate of 0.4%. Remember, so some of my models had 8% growth rate. Now, it's ridiculous. Populations don't grow that fast, but they could, theoretically. But that is incredibly slow. And in, in fact, just about any model that has any growth at all, you can get this many people in those many years. So the, the human population size actually is a biblical human population size. If evolution was true and we existed for so many thousands of years before that, there should be trillions of people. Not that it's possible. Or someone should have invented farming earlier than that. <laughs> or, or another way to ask, to ask it is this. If a million people live for about a million years, where are the trillions of bodies? That's a really good question. They don't exist. There's no bones down there. Yeah, th there, there are some ancient bones we found. Great, but those are post-flood people. Right. There should be millions upon millions upon millions of cemeteries, old villages, and you know, remains of people don't find them. I believe it's because they didn't exist. Now, looking at the Adam and Eve story, we can make some predictions. First, if we only started with two people, all the people today should have a low genetic diversity. If we started with millions of people, you can have a lot of genes floating around in a population of millions strong. But if you only started with two people, that restricts the diversity today. If the Bible's correct and Adam is really is our ancestor, there should only be one male ancestor of humanity. And the mitochondrial DNA, the mtDNA, that's a little piece of DNA that's only inherited from your mother. All people get it from their mother. Well, that means we can build a family tree of all the females in the world, and there should only be one female ancestor of everyone on earth today. If evolution is true, that shouldn't be true, and none of those have to be true. But also, most genes should come in two versions because Eve was taken from Adam. She probably got Adam's genome, except for the Y chromosome. But Adam only has two copies of each gene, so you can only have two versions of each gene. Turns out, this is exactly what we have found in modern human genetics. Huh. Wow. I mean, what's the chance of, of the Bible being made up and the biblical story actually mirrors what we actually see in human genetics today? That's amazing. Totally amazing. Absolutely. We look at Noah's flood. Noah's flood tells all people should be close related. It tells us there should only be a few mitochondrial DNA lines. That's Shem, Ham, and Japheth's wives. Right. And only one Y chromosome because it's only Noah. His three sons would have inherited his Y chromosome. Any other Y chromosome diversity before the flood is gone. And we should have evidence of rapid population growth. We saw that a minute ago. 
turns out that this is exactly what we find in modern genetics. It's the Noah's flood story also. One Y and only a few uh, of the ladies' genes. Yeah. Exactly. Didn't have to be true. And in the Tower of Babel account, we have discovered a single disperse of all people in the relatively recent past, traveling in small people groups into uninhabited territory through the Middle East. They call it the out of Africa story. But these are all biblical predictions right here. Single dispersal, all at one time, relatively recent past, traveling in small groups to uninhabited areas throughout the Middle East. That's exactly what happened. Yes. And this the, is the only, uh, they think it's a little further south in Africa, you think it's a little further north in The starting point east. is a little different, yeah. but the same pattern the, is predicted exactly, by both, both sides. Exactly, and they're totally agreeing with you on that. Yes, except they want it here as right. far as the starting point goes. Right. But the Bible says this. Yes. Now, interestingly, I'm sure you've had people on your show talking about the biblical ice age. Mm -hmm. During that ice age, which was approximately the same time as the Tower of Babel, oh. you could have walked from here to Ireland on dry ground. Sure. You could have walked to Tasmania. Yeah. And the, only, well, the only deep water part you have to cross is a place between these two little islands, Bali and Lombok. And you can see one island from the other. It's right there. It's not... And you could have walked all the way down to here on dry ground huh. at that one point in history, not any other point in history. It all adds up. It does. If we look at the evolutionary out of Africa story, that's a Tower of Babel story right there. Okay. Now they want to push the origin way down deep in here, but that's actually bad. The graphic artist put it there. It should be up here because this is the greatest amount of diversity. But they put it there because they can't put it there. <laughs> they could not put it there. And if we just look at the history of man and compare it to the evolutionary timeline and the biblical timeline. So they believe that about a million Homo erectuses lived in Africa and Asia for about a million years. And then something happened. Our population was reduced to, they say, an effective population size of about 10,000 people. That's called extinction. And there's about that many cheetahs in, in Africa today. And all the population biologists think they're going to go extinct, or a lot of them. They're worried about cheetahs. Well, somehow during this catastrophic event, modern humans evolved. And then we spread out of Africa and co covered the world. Well, the biblical timeline says we started with Adam and Eve a few thousand years ago went to some unknown number before the flood, were reduced to eight souls during Noah's flood, and then a couple hundred years later, we hit the Tower of Babel event when we spread out across the world. Do you know why the evolutionist has this dip right there? No. Because they're trying to explain how come all people across the world are so similar to one another. They didn't predict it from their timeline because this many people, a million people, you have a lot of genetic diversity in there. So the genome is driving them back to a small number. Yes, they if were. You have an explanation for it. They really don't. Yeah, they were forced to do it because of the data. The Bible predicted that. Yes. That's really neat. Now, let's take a step back and let's look at some, some data from world populations. This is some data from, from a, a major a multi-million dollar study where they looked at genetic diversity amongst people across the world. And what I did is I pulled that data and I made this chart. And this is the allele frequency is how many people in the world have a particular gene. And so you can see there, there are some genes that are very rare and they're found in a lot of people. Some genes that are very common found in a lot of people. And there's not so many genes in the middle. If, if we started with Adam and Eve, I suspect that just about all the genes would be at 50% because Adam had two, each chromosome, that's, you know, one plus one is, you know, each one is 50%. How can we have this pattern if we expect that pattern? Well, I happen to have written a computer model to handle this also. And what this, what is, what this is, is I start with Adam and Eve, and here's their 50-50 uh, genes right there in the background. And every 100 years, I save the pattern of genes in this pop, population on the computer. And I ran it for 6,000 years. And right here, this plateau, that's Noah's flood, where I, I pick eight people of the population, three of them are brothers, and I reset it, and 100 years after the flood, genetic diversity drops. These wings right here, those are genes that are lost from the population. It's something original in Adam and Eve, but by the time you get to here, everyone in the world has that gene, or no one in the world has that gene. That's what those two wings are. Now, looking at this, look at this. How do we 
is this real? I mean, is that, does that match this? And the answer is, yeah, this smile right here. And that smile. That's going to happen right there. Ah, okay. Now, this is a population of 1,000 people. If I did the population of 500 people, this gets flatter. There's all sorts of ways. In fact, if, if, if Noah and his family are all closely related to one another, I picked out random women from the population. What if they're sisters? That gets flatter. And so computer models, we're getting to the point where we're looking at this and this, and we're saying these are very similar things. That's really fascinating. We, we need to take a break, and we'll come back and pick up uh, right there. So don't you go away. We'll be right back. seems to me that your genetics fits perfectly with the numbers when we look to the past. How's the future look? Oh, actually, the future doesn't look very good. Uh oh And there's several different ways we can spin this. First of all, you've got about 100 trillion cells in your body. Okay. Every single possible genetic mutation exists in you. Every one. Because every time your cells divide, they add more letter mistakes. Yeah. Um, but it's, happily, we don't pass on our skin cells, which have most of the mutations to our children. But even in our reproductive cells, they also pick up mutations. And every child born has probably about 100 brand new mutations, sometimes more, sometimes less. But that's really bad. Natural selection would have to remove them to prevent us from going extinct eventually. Um, and so because of that, every possible genetic mutation is passed on into the next generation hundreds, if not thousands of times over. That's, that, that's tremendously bad for a population. In fact, geneticists can't explain how a population could survive for long periods of time with that mutation rate. I wrote a, another paper with a dear friend of mine, John Sanford, um, and we were looking at the influenza genome. Now, the flu is under strong natural selection because it's at war with the human immune system. Mm -hmm. The only flus that get passed on are the ones that escape the human immune system. That's called natural selection. You got to get past a filter. And we looked at uh, sequenced flu viruses all the way back to 1918. And we discovered this chart. What this is is um, how many mutations are in the virus over time. And the straight line increase means that natural selection is not removing the mutations. Oh. Even though it's under natural selection, natural selection is only preventing the accumulation of the ones that are really bad. But enough of them accumulated over time that the human H1N1 virus, the yeah. big one that killed so many people right after World War I, right. went extinct in 2009. Oh, praise God. Yeah. That virus could not withstand that number of mutations. Now, fast forward to the human population. We are not going to last for millions of years. And if we can't last for millions of years into the future, we could not have existed millions of years in the past. So this has a, not just a dire warning for the future. It, it speaks to the fact that we aren't that old. We can't be that old. Can't be. be uh, now, granted, the, the flu virus has a higher mutation rate. Mm -hmm. But there's been enough generations and people that we can extrapolate at 100 mutations per person over time, we will not be here a million years hence. So the millions and millions of years that uh, the evolutionist wants for our development can't be given give understanding mutations. That's right. Okay. And even allowing for natural selection. So that is not their savior. So if we can summarize all these things that we've said. Please. It appears that all humans descend from one man and one woman. We call that Adam and Eve. We can conclude that the flood was not a genetic disaster. It wouldn't have led to the extinction of the population. It would have caused a flattening of the allele frequency distribution, but not extinction. Okay. Um, we can see the Tower of Babel in our genes, and the way the genes are spread out around the world. I mean, screaming Tower of Babel. It's easy to get 7 billion people, and yet, at the same time, mutations are driving us to extinction. 
it lines up with the Bible perfectly. Yes, it does. It lines up with a young earth perfectly. Yes, it does. Uh, and genetics has br brought a whole new dimension to this debate, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. And genetics has been able to, we've been able to confirm major biblical statements using genetics. That, that's amazing. Folks, I hope that you've appreciated as I have Dr. Carter's work. I don't know how many times in there he said, we wrote a paper. And uh, his, his research and study is, is fascinating. And the more he digs, the more he brings us back to the truth of Scripture. We see it in Adam and Eve. We see it uh, in, in the uh, flood. We see it in the Tower of Babel. We see it in history today. I hope that this confirms your faith. I hope you'll join us again soon here on Origins. Remember, it's God's view that he created you. That should be your view too. See you again soon here on Origins. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.